Hey guys, welcome back to Chad and Mel Movie Hour. We are taking a little bit of a reprieve from the Alien Predator universe um, because we have some big things coming down the pike and I think it's kind of impossible not to be discussing Joker right now. So I saw it on opening night when I was in Orlando. Um, it was amazing. I've since seen it two more times. And Chad, I think you saw it with Jonathan last night for the first time. Uh, and yeah, so yes. I want to hear your reactions, but just to give the audience a little bit of context, um, the film is uh, directed by Todd Phillips, who up until this point is most famously known for his comedies, um, which are very much like bro comedies. Mm. Um, not a judgment, just a fact. So we have all three Hangover movies are under his belt, Old School, um, and a couple other. So, you know, it, in that vein, that's what we're dealing with. And this is his first foray into something I consider to be high art. Um, he co-wrote the screenplay with Scott Silver, and the cinematographer is a gentleman named Lawrence Scher. Uh, it stars Joaquin Phoenix, as we know, and everyone is giving him rave reviews, no surprise there. Um, you also have Frances Conroy, who's a legend, and she portrays his mother. You have um, Brian Tyree, um, is it Henson, uh, from Atlanta that plays um, the clerk in Arkham. You have Zazie Beetz, uh, who plays his love interest, so obviously you have an amazing cast. Um, but yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Chad, since you just saw it, and it's fresh in your mind, for your initial Joker reaction. <clears throat> Well, I absolutely loved it. Um, this is my kind of film. Like, I kind of knew that going in, and so I was a little excited. But just throughout the whole film, I was like, yes, this is my kind of film. And I just like, I, I just like to see films that make you think and make you talk. And this film did that so much. It had people talking before anyone had ever even seen it. Like, it was this big thing and you had a lot of people making uninformed uh, remarks before it came out and I just think it hit on a lot of hot button things um, like violence which is unfortunately um, really prevalent in our culture right now and um, so also comic book movies which are like the biggest thing right now with the string of Marvel films that were just created the 22 or 23, you'll forgive me, but it's just not my thing. But um, so I think you had people going in the theater like, oh, this is going to be like a comic book film. And it was a film about a comic book character, but it was not a comic book film in any other re regard. It was like a very gritty character study of this character, but grounded in a lot of what makes what I think of as reality, which is just how they shot it and how it was portrayed, how it was acted. Um, so if you're going for like a lot of action or like extravaganza in that regard, you're not gonna get it. If you really wanna think about heady topics and have great conversations with smart people after the film, this is like your film. Take your, take your film buff friends and like, this is an amazing, of course, Joaquin did an incredible job. The whole cast did, I think. Um, I, I'm still thinking about this film and it's been like a few days since I've seen it, but it works on so many different levels. Um, I love how dark it is. I don't think it was too violent. I don't think, I don't think art has to be beholden to what any one individual thinks it should be. I think there is room for even violent art and I don't really even consider this violent art but you had a lot of people up in arms about the violence. There's way less violence in this film than even like a typical comic book movie. But the tone is so dark that when it does happen, it grips you in such a more powerful way. It's so much more realistic. It's so much darker just because of context. That's my initial rant on this film, but I loved it. It was incredible. Well, um, I agree with you 100%, and uh, I thought your rant was on point. It is, I, I, I didn't find it especially violent. There's, I think, one scene in it that was fairly graphic in terms of just, like, straight-on, brutal, somebody getting murdered. But I think, to your point, I mean, 
pretty much every other movie out there right now. There was a couple. There were a couple. Yeah, but I think, you know, Not many, but like a few. There's still movies out there in general that house more violence in them, but because of the tone of this movie and because of the themes of this movie, they hold more weight, which is totally fine. But what's interesting to me is that even though it's, I mean, it's, it's a DC movie insofar as that it's, it takes place within the DC universe, which has had such a difficult time finding its footing compared to Marvel, who knows its mm. audience, knows its tone, you know, they can just pump it out and, you know, for the most part, they're all good or great, you know, for what they are. Whereas DC is really all over the fucking place. I think with the exception of Wonder Woman, um, there really hasn't been anything of substance DC wise since Christopher Nolan had his hands on the Batman franchise and before that Schumacher and Burton. Um, but then we have Todd Phillips, right? Enter Todd Phillips out of like nowhere, you know, coming off the Hangover franchise, just delivering what I consider to be um, a movie of substance. And one of its biggest critiques is that it's guised in substance, but really has none. You know, there's a lot of critics from the New York Times to the Hollywood Reporter that are saying that it's, it's dabbling in heady themes and, you know, racial themes and mental illness and class, but it doesn't actually go there with any of them. It just kind of um, uses them as almost, um, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for, but it almost uses them to seduce the audience in and then just doesn't really handle them or discuss them or go anywhere with them. And, and I would argue that that's not the case, but you had mentioned, you know, that what, this is one of the types, the kinds of movies that you like because it had almost this entire controversy that preceded its release um, about, you know, does the world really need a na another narrative about a white man who's killing people, right? And I think we do. I think that's precisely why we need it is because the world needs um, an invitation and an opportunity to maybe explore some of the reasons why the white man is collapsing in on himself, the straight heteronormative white male. Um, yeah. I loved the film. I knew what I was getting going into it. I knew it wasn't gonna be a comic book movie. I knew we were getting an origin story, but it was going to be, you know, moved from the genre and then the genre gets reinserted in after the fact, which is something that Darren Aronofsky has, has talked about as well. Um, but one of the controversial things that preceded the movie was, you know, the idea of incels and, you know, is this just going to be another opportunity for people to see a white male terrorist as a hero and then, you know, go out and shoot people, you know, because they've been given permission to. And I think that that's a stretch and I think that it's certainly possible that some kid masturbating in his mom's basement to... Fortnite or something who, you know, was not loved properly could, you know, this is an oversimplification, but of course it's possible, but I think to reduce the movie down to, um, to that is unfair and it's just a gross oversimplification of themes in the movie, not to get too political, but that's kind of why what people went into this movie, I think, expecting is, is that, and I think some people, because of that, that's what they got, and other people were like, no, I it for something more or whatever. Yes, <clears throat> I totally agree. Um, the director, it's, it is interesting that, that this director, and I've seen a bunch of um, Q&A panels with the cast and the director and interviews with the director. He is very well spoken. He's very you could tell he made an intentional film. You could tell he put a lot of thought into it. You could tell this was not an accident. You could tell that um, he was, he's a really smart guy. He's really likable. Um, I don't love his all of his past movies. Hangover was a classic but uh, for comedy, but um, you, know, you could argue there's definitely some hit or misses in there, whatever. Yeah. Um, but we're de definitely to focus on this film. Um, I love this film and it gets into that age old debate, right? About like, is, is violent uh, entertainment creating violence? And we've been down this rabbit hole so many times back when, 
you know, I was younger with Marilyn Manson and before that with violent movies and, and then with video games and it just, it cycles round and round. I think violent people are attracted to those, to that entertainment. They're going to be violent either way. I don't think you can blame or hold film or entertainment to the, to, um, I don't think you sh anyone should really be able to, to define what an artist or a director or a singer wants to make. I think they have a lot of right to make almost any kind of art they want to make. Uh, well effing said, because I think that even if, well, let me say this, I'm not playing devil's advocate, but um, I, I think just to rule out that art can breed violence in an individual um, is, is not a statement I would make. I, I don't think it's the only thing, and I don't think you can blame a piece of art entirely for creating a criminal or some uh, a violent act on somebody having been exposed to X or Y or Z or an amalgamation of um, anything. But I think that even if I were to play devil's advocate and say video games or violence in whatever format, film, whatever, create violent people, I still don't think that if that were true, that that would warrant us censoring art, no matter how violent it is. Because once you begin to do that, right. you go down the rabbit hole and then, you know, flash forward, we're burning books, right? Like, so even if that were, yeah. I don't think it's, it's, it's um, a logical um, reaction to censor the art. But I don't think it's the case 100% of the time in 100% of, you know, context. Um, is it possible? Sure. Is it a contributor? Of course. But is it the sole reason? I don't think so. And, and you know, you have right. Todd Phillips who, you know, in, in the many interviews he's done in promoting this film has said that he's taken influence from Taxi Driver, which is a very racially charged movie about, you know, misogyny and a white male that loses his shit and snaps and, you know, the, the repercussions of that. And also the king of comedy, um, which is very similar and, and has this kind of almost same scene flipped in Joker where he meets his mm -hmm. idol, Robert yeah. He was in the King of Comedy playing more of a Joker type role um, and snaps on live TV. And both of these things are based on an actual event that took place in the 70s. So you have the, the director pulling from these references from, you know, film references from the late 70s and maybe even early 80s. Um, there's another movie with Harvey Keitel that he references that I can't think of the name of where he plays a pimp. But anyways, like, there's all of these like references where you have a white man who cracks for whatever reason, and it's the the fallout of that gentleman cracking. And right. I think in the Harvey Keitel movie, which I, I need to look up, um, the original ending of that was going to end, or maybe it was Taxi Driver. One of them was going to end with the main character killing a bunch of black people, and the studio said no, <laughs> um, so they they didn't do that. Um, but imagine like what that what those movies would have, I, I don't know, that's a whole different rabbit hole, but I think with right. the subway scene in Joker, which happens in the first act, where you see Arthur Fleck um, get harassed, essentially, by three, two or three wall dudes, you know, um, that was based on an actual event, the Bernhard uh, Getz murders in the 70s, where this gentleman was on the subway, a white gentleman, and ended up killing three or four black teenagers who were just simply like harassing him for a cigarette or whatever. Um, but they flipped it and instead of him killing black people, he killed white people because it seemed to be more of a commentary on class in that moment than race. But I'm interested to like know, like, do, did you feel like the scenes where Arthur gets violent, they're shown only he they only show him getting violent with other white people but there's black people in the movie where violence is alluded to but not shown so i'm curious like do you think that that's right. a conscious choice because todd phillips hasn't really come out and said one way or the other or do you think that that was him just being tone deaf which a lot of critics are claiming where violence wasn't shown 
against black people, but only against white people. Right. Did you notice how many um, um, co co stars were African American though in this film? You had so many around him, none of which um, really had violence perpetra perpetrated on them. That is interesting. Um, pretty much everyone in his life um, was a black male or female, other than, you know, of course, his mother and maybe a few other people. But, hmm, I don't know. But uh, about Taxi Driver, it's been so long since I've seen Taxi Driver that. I'm not sure which shots were like direct recreations. I'd have to go back and watch Taxi Driver. Um, so to me, it wasn't like over the top apparent, but I definitely see it. And I've heard from people more, even more familiar with Taxi Driver that it, it went a little too far with that, where there's like the gun, the gun, like I'm gonna blow my brains out, that thing came from Taxi Driver. I don't think, it would have been nice if there were some more I guess original things in place of those things maybe because I don't think it had to be such like so tied to Taxi Driver or some of these other references um, because it does have so many great things on its own you know what I mean I love it as a study of just mental illness the way it looks at mental illness is different than way the way that films used to look at mental illness it looks at it um, through a much less like judgmental um, perspective. And I, uh, mental illness is such a, um, what's the word? Uh, just such a topic that is so being, being sort of discussed right now by everybody. And um, so I think the film is really timely for that reason. You have a lot of activists and people speaking out about mental illness and how we, treat those who are you know having a mental break or struggling with mental illness so um the film is so timely for that reason but i like i like that um the way it's shown everything feels so much more like it could be a real person and not just a comic book character but i love that it is a character study of a villain because i always find the villains more interesting and i just i've always been interested in Joker so like this is like the per perfect marriage of like that realistic film style with a character study of a fascinating character where like whenever I watch a movie and Joker's in it I'm like why isn't it a Joker movie <laughs> why 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 isn't it just Joker the star like when Batman comes on I'm like uh bring back Joker so so I was like excited about this for that there's so many that, I mean, this film inspires so much dialogue. I went through the, the internet and, and watched tons of clips and read a lot of articles and stuff. And there's so much um, discussion around this film. That is pretty inspiring and, and cool, even that films are inspiring that level of, of conversation right now is amazing. But um, there were a lot of people like jumping, rushing to judgment, making these like you know um social warrior commentary before it even came out and it's like you know take several seats yeah seriously just view the movie yeah it's I, I we're fans of the movie we're biased and i've tried to look at this movie through the lens of like people that see it as just like this empty kind of vacuous white male commentary on another white male and trying to like make a villain a terrorist or whatever you want to call him empathetic or right. um, sympathetic to him um but and, and but i think that that's important i think that you know not to go like full like christian or biblical on anybody's ass but i really believe that we should love thy enemy and i don't mean that in a literal sense i mean in the sense of empathizing and trying to understand because if we don't then how are we going to eliminate the evil in the world if we can't even begin to understand it or are scared to look at it and i think that right, right you know the with outrage culture and you know the liberals you know 
which I will put both of us in that category if I have your permission to do so, you know, there, there is extremism happening on the left right now that feels like a course correction, but in, in so far as it is, it's definitely way over here, you know, right now. Um, and all of this outrage culture and everything okay. is exhausting because it's, you know, it doesn't leave any room or oxygen right. room for us to discuss the uncomfortable things, which is that the white hetero right. right now is the devil. And to a certain extent, he's getting his due, right? But then there's also the, the conversation around like, okay, well, sure, yes, he's getting his due, but like, are we, how far are we gonna take this? Like, are we just going to never let anyone, uh, give anyone the opportunity to redeem themselves or wow. change? And, and I think the great thing about this movie, um, and I do wanna talk about the mental illness for a minute, but I think the great thing about this movie is that it's begging, it's, it's not even begging those questions, it's demanding the audience to, to ask themselves these questions. So whatever you thought of the movie, right. comic booky enough, it was to this, it was to that, too conservative, too liberal, too political. Like the fact that it's created this level of dialogue is a testament to the filmmakers and the acting, in my opinion. Because we talk right. about pretty much every. I agree. Too, with the exception of maybe Alien versus Predator, but like we talk about this. Like, are, are we demanding too much of the audience? And I think no. I think we need to demand more of the audience. And if the audience doesn't like it, well, I'm sure. Sucks, but. I think that it's important. I think is asking these questions. Of course, and the film doesn't hold your hand to to give you thought. You have to have your own sense of thought. Like you, you have to be able to be given a glimpse of something and then be able to ruminate in your own mind. And that's what this film did. That was so great for me. Um, I think in our culture, like in the workplace, in um, our society, we just don't, still don't understand mental illness or treat it properly or look at it properly, even, you know, in, in work environments, in um, everywhere. So um, I think that a lot of um, people who are suffering from mental illness in whatever way, a lot, a lot of them, um, a lot of the violence that has happened in this country is kind of born out of that, of, of, of not diagnosing and not helping people who are struggling in one way or, or another with thoughts of violence, thoughts of harm to themselves or others. And um, it's, it's pretty amazing that this film addresses that, all of those type of concepts like head on, but it's not gonna tell you what to think and it's not gonna hold your hand the whole way. You have to if anything, it, it wants to say, I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm just going to tell you what to think about. Because then you, everyone can go and have this like brilliant conversation that is it's so gratifying. It, it has been so long since I've gone to the theater and seen a film where you can come out with, with your friends at the end of the film and go get coffee and talk about it for like two hours. This is that kind of film. And it's, it's a gift for that reason. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise be. Uh, named, named, and named. Yeah, I, I think not only do we not understand mental illness, but for the most part, I don't think society and culture wants to even go there. I think, like, the minute we pass through this level of medication, um, the conversation just falls apart, unless you're in certain communities. But especially mental illness around the white male terrorist figure, right? Like the vil the ultimate villain, right? Is the, the fact that the movie's asking you to consider being sympathetic towards like the worst creature on earth, right? Like pretty much the, the archetype that's perpetrating all of the violence in the world right now. Not all, of, it's a generalization, but stay with me. You know, like the, the right. mass killings, you know, the, the school shootings, you know, the, um, just to ask. It's true. Somebody to, police shootings. Police shootings, yeah. To, to ask what would bring a young white adolescent male to pick up a gun and go to a church and 
you know, shoot a bunch of black people or shoot a bunch of Jewish people or shoot a bunch of gay people or shoot whomever, we should be asking why. Mm -hmm. And I think that we don't have to um, necessarily forgive if that's not where you're at in life or certainly not forget, but I mean, to try and understand, if we don't try and understand why young right. people this category are behaving the way we they do then that's just to me solidifies the fact that our society and culture is completely diseased because we're not even willing to look at it so how are we ever going to right right like you have how are, how are we going to change it yeah and i mean i know there, there's a lot of critics on this movie that are you know well, we're being too sympathetic right a and b like we're touching on mental illness, we're touching on class, we're touching on race, racism, but the movie never really goes there on anything. I think it does go there because it's putting it in the audience's hands to figure it out. Like you right. said, holding your hand and telling you, oh, this is what racism means for, for you, and this is what classism means. No, it's telling Absolutely. you, like, th this shit is happening every day, and there is a, dis a sociocultural disease read on racism, classism, and all of the isms, mental illness as well, that is breeding people that are disenchanted with reality as they know it, and there are no tools to cope with reality, especially if you're already prone to mental illness and delusion like the Joker is, and you have no money. Right. And early on in the first act, when he's meeting with a social worker, I thought one of the greatest parts of that movie is when she, who is an African-American woman, says to him after she can't provide him with refills for his, her, his prescriptions or whatever, like she says, quote unquote, they don't care about people like us, meaning the disenfranchised, right. they're both of a different race. So it's speaking to class in that moment. Um, and the right. fact that you have this theme of delusion throughout the movie, I wanted to talk to you about that because clearly we know he's mentally ill. Yeah mother's mentally ill which we find out they kind of leave the is he bruce wayne's step half brother or not kind of up in the air because right at first we we're led to believe that he is and then we're told oh mom made it up because she's crazy but then it's like well uh what's bruce wayne's father's name charles wayne i can't ever oh. remember. he they, they make him out and obviously sorry go ahead go ahead Obviously, we're going to have spoilers. I was just announcing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I think we, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be a spoiler channel. Like, all the videos that, that you make are, this is not we're going to spoil because we want to talk about all of it. We don't want to limit ourselves. It's not a yeah. safe You're coming here. You better have No. Yes. But so. Well, I'm um, I was just going to say one. Okay, so I love all the. <laughs> you go. go ahead. You go. You go. I just love that. I just love that. Okay, so like the stuff with, with whether or not he was adopted or if that was planted by um, Bruce Wayne's father. And was, was Bruce, I can't remember his name either, but was he the father of both the Joker and Bruce Wayne? Like that was like mind blowing. Um, and the fact that they don't explain it at the end, I love that. Like, I absolutely love that, but I, I am of my own that hers were, like, fabricated and that he is his father. That's what I think. Because the mother, the mom said that, um, that, oh, he, he had all that made up. And of course she was, we were led to believe that she was delusional and not thinking right. But I think that maybe, like, maybe she was right in that moment about that, you know? And um, just because how interesting would that be? Okay, so I know that we're having a good movie hour when we start talking over each other because we're so effing excited. So I apologize if I talked over you just before. Yes. Like, really excited and the, the delay. No, go. Okay, so two things. You just, you just a little light bulb off in my head. But I wanted to say, so it's Thomas Wayne. Daddy is Thomas. Um, I was doing a little okay. bit of research about Thomas Wayne because in all of the movies prior to Joker, and I, we're, you're dealing with uh, two people that are not well read in the comic books, you know, as comic books. I, I know some of the Amen. Key, but I'm not 
Um, the only comic I've ever read is The Walking Dead. Anyways, so the Thomas Wayne character has always been made out to be this benevolent billionaire philanthropist, right? Like he can do no wrong. He's like the one one percenter that like is a good guy. And I was reading that in right. um, iterations of the Batman and Joker comics, they've made Thomas into more of like a one percenter where he's more of an opportunist and you know, his philanthropy persona is just that, it's a persona, and then he actually has ties to the, the mob that you see in Batman Begins. Um, anyways, so I, clearly Todd Phillips is pulling on that string where we're seeing Thomas Wayne as possibly not so great of a guy, right? But all of that aside, whether or not Arthur Fleck, which Arthur Fleck is not Joker's real name in any of the comics. That's something Todd Phillips made up, which I just learned. Um, yeah, yes. he completely did his own thing. But I say all of that to say that regardless of whether Joker is Bruce Wayne's adopted brother, stepbrother, half-brother, whatever the fuck is going on, the fact that Arthur Fleck's mother, who worked for the Wayne family in this narrative, we know is mentally ill and delusional. But to your point, what you just said made the light bulb go off in my head. You can be mentally ill, you can be fully fucking delusional, you can be schizophrenic, and also still have some truth. You could also be telling the truth about something. Right. So just because she neglected and abused her son, just because she was delusional, just because X, Y, and Z doesn't mean she didn't fuck Thomas Wayne and he left her out to dry. Yeah. I think that's something right. that we don't talk about in the real world enough is that you can be mentally ill and still be trying to tell somebody a truth, but you're not going to be believed because you're mentally that's ill. That's true. And I think the film was making that point in that moment. It was leading you not to believe her, just to bury that truth there. Yeah. As, as like a hidden thing, like, hey, believe this or not, you know what I mean? Um, two things real quick. One, there was one scene that kind of bothered me that I could have done without. Only really one in the whole movie. Um, here's what I thought. So his relationship with the girl down the hall, it seems like way too good to be true. She's like totally with it. She's fabulous. She's beautiful. It just seems like way too good to be true when he bursts in to like effort. She's like really willing. And it just, it all happens really quick. And you, you get a sense that this is not real. So later they show him in her apartment and she comes out, doesn't even recognize him. She's like, oh, are you that guy down the hall? She puts it together and she's like, you're not supposed to be in here. That's when the audience is like, gets that confirmation of what we already suspected that yes, that was all in his head. But then the movie holds your hand in that one moment by giving you all these flashbacks, showing you that she wasn't in the scenes with him when we are already doing that in our minds as an audience or an intelligent audience, hopefully. That's what I was doing. So I thought that was like one step too far where it was kind of like a little bit just too much like we get uh, the moment we see that he's not supposed to be in there we get it we start putting oh you know and then um but that's like like a trick that a bunch of films have done in the past so you really wasn't in these scenes you know what i mean so not only was it hand holding but it was also a little bit like oh this has been done a lot before so that's one thing that I wanted to say that I thought was a little like um, I could I could have done without. And the other thing I wanted to get into um, with you is when he transforms into the character of the Joker because he's Arthur and then he's the Joker. And he's what's so brilliant is he's a brilliant actor, but he's totally playing two characters. You get two for one in this movie. Um, so you see him rehearse the the part where he is going to come out on the talk show. Once once they call him and they say they want him on the Murray Murray show, whatever, um, he rehearses it a bunch of times in his living room because he's excited and he knows he's going to go on it. But he's nervous. He's awkward. He's he's socially awkward. 
he fumbles, he stumbles, he is like a bumbling idiot, right? Um, Cause that's Arthur. But when the Joker finally does come out and he is fully trans, you know, trans um, formed into the Joker, he is the opposite of that, right? Like he is confident, he is like wicked, he is like a slick, he is all these, all these different things, right? And it's not like an opposite, but it's different. It's like a different character. And you can see it in like the way he moves and like, oh, and we got to talk about his dancing, which is awesome. And like um, a way for him to cope with things, I feel too. Um, I heard that theory and I agree with that. Um, but it's fascinating to see him become the Joker and to see him like relish that the whole city's on fire because of him. And, and um, I particularly love the scene at the end when there's blood in his mouth and he takes it and uses it to wipe wipe into like a big bloody grin, um, which looks more like traditional Joker where he has like the cuts there or whatever. Um, just amazing. <laughs> okay. All right. So about everything that you just said, <laughs> all of it was just amazing. So this, this idea that, okay. Let me take a step back because I'm so excited right now. When the audience first discovers that Sophie, played by Zazie Beetz, is not in fact his girlfriend and it's all in his head, and he's sitting in her living room and you see this single mother like just in fear for her life and her child's life because there's this fucking crazy guy in her living room, it like that was enough. I don't think the to your point, I don't think the audience needed their hand held with like the flashbacks to all of the scenes, but it is a narrative. Right storytelling device it, it it confirms in the audience's head okay what you just saw wasn't real so yeah I don't think we needed it but I it didn't piss me off it was just like okay this is what movies do now but it begs the question then from that point forward if you hadn't already been asking yourself the question as an audience member like what else is it real that we've seen right and I've seen some really like crazy Reddit rabbit holes where people are like, you know, right. pulls everything out of the refrigerator and gets in, and goes and sits inside of the refrigerator. He's oxygen deprived. So everything from that moment on is just a mass delusion that he's having. I mean, that's obviously a stretch and not what the movie is, but it makes you right. like question like what is real? Like, did he kill his mother? I mean, seems like he did but then it makes you you know at the end with the twist where you're seeing that he didn't actually kill Bruce Wayne's parents it was his cronies you know that are doing it so like all of this stuff that we count on as being canon around this character is really being brought into question and I have to shift because mm -hmm. I'm licking her asshole right now okay get her out of the scene but I think that, um, you know, going back to mental illness for a second, you know, you have mental illness, right? And then you have mental illness that is being, um, I don't know what, how to articulate this, that is being fed by poverty and classism, right? So it's one thing to be mentally ill and have access to good care, and it's an, quite another to be mentally ill and be poor. And I think the movie illustrates that very, very, very well. Um, I think the fact that you have uh, the, the, the um, director and the cinematographer and all of the, you know, the writers leading you to believe one thing and then you realizing, oh, nothing is what it seems, is also mm -hmm. on the subliminal yeah. asking the audience to question their own mental health because it's very, it's very subtle, and I might be going a little bit too far with things here, but I think when, when you see something on film and it's one way for 90% of the story and then they give you the twist, I think that's almost a way of like inviting you to question like what reality is. And, and if right. you as a sane person can't tell the difference, then you should be expected, I think, then to empathize with somebody who on an everyday 24-7 level can't tell the difference. 
I don't know. That's just something that yeah. comes up. Um, with regards also, to I think I think some people go too far and they want to be like, oh, none of it was real. Well, then there'd really be no story. So, like, I do want to believe that he killed who he killed, and I do want to believe some of the story because it makes it more of an actual story to me and not just, like, right. a delusion. Um, I well, don't know why that's better to me, but, yeah, I just... It's not teaching anybody anything. It's not inviting you to think critically if it's all just, like, fake. Yeah. <laughs> what would be the point? Why make the movie, you know? It's too, it's too good, fascinating of a story to be like it didn't happen. Yeah. And I, mean, I would rather it happened in yeah. this story, not and in I, real life. But. I, I think it, it is happening, and I think there are certain things that are delusions and certain things that aren't, and I think the line that that is between the two is very blurred, and that's the point. Right. You know, early on, he talks about his... And it talks... Go ahead, go ahead. It talks so much about, like, um, the things that we're all battling right now, like the wealth inequality this the extreme wealth inequality that we're seeing now that people like, you know, Bernie Sanders are fighting against, you know, while they're running right now. But like, it really confronts you with that, but also confronts you with the chaos of like, the, the far and extreme of that, if it were to go on and intensify. So it's almost like showing you like, like with everyone killed the rich and the newspapers and all the clown masks and everything. Um, I think it's really getting into that and dealing with like social unrest and also just um, like you said, uh, people almost driven mad from being held down for so long and not being given a shot, not being given a decent wage to earn from hard work and stuff like that. It's, it's extremely difficult to get by for most people in this country and it shouldn't be because it's the number one country that I guess it's great again. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, but um, it's definitely not great again. I mean, this has always been a great country, but um, there's there's so much that we need to improve, to, I feel like, to help people out. And this film uh, deals with that. A lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, two things about that. Like, number one, early on in the movie, Arthur Fleck's character, well, Arthur Fleck, the character, says that his mom always told him to put on a happy face and smile, right? And you hear, like, Charlie Chaplin's smile is playing multiple times throughout the movie, if I remember correctly. I mean, at least once. Um, but yeah. this notion of putting on the guise of being happy and okay, even when you're not. And when he's on the Murray Franklin or whoever show, the Robert De Niro talk show, and he's, he starts to reveal himself for what he is and says, you know, the, the worst thing about being mentally ill is that people expect you to act as if you're not, right? And so this conversation right. about the, the normal people, whatever that means, being so uncomfortable with mental illness that we can't even discuss it, we can't address it, and therefore, people that are really mentally ill, or even people like myself who deal with panic attacks and just general anxiety, you know, like having to put on a functional face or a functional mood to get through the day when really, like, you want to show be up every day to work and. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's, and one of the things in one of the, I think it was either in the New York Times or the Hollywood Reporter, I'll find it and I'll link it, but. It was, a, it was an article that was criticizing the movie as not being good. And they referenced um, somebody on Twitter, and I, I'll, I'll link it below because I didn't write it down, but she basically says, like, this movie should be called, um, where is it? She said the movie should have been called We Live in a Society, colon, the movie. Like, she, she was basically, like, saying the movie is not great because it's just a commentary on everything we already know, but I think that's why it is great is because it's a commentary. That's why it is great. Yeah. Oh, and I love journalists that are, are, um, I love journalists that cite Twitter. Right, yeah, that's so always... Fuck you. America <laughs> is great again. But I, I think... That's, that's some, that's some detailed journalism right yeah, there. Right? Your references go as far as the Twitter. Hard work. But I think, you yeah. know, the fact that it is a movie about what, it, because it's that simple is what makes it great. Because even if she's right and it's 
the movie should be called, what did she say? We live in a society, call in the movie. Even if that's true, mm. the, the fact of the matter is we don't talk about any of this shit. We don't know how to right. deal with the white man that is the terrorist that's shooting people. We don't know how to We're talk only about just starting to, yeah. Even if yep. it's just a, a mirror and nothing more, then in, that in, in itself is important, in my opinion. But anyways, that was just one yeah. of the things. But um, the other thing... Um, I think in... Yeah. Go on. And in our culture, I think that white men have historically thought that they had an advantage. And I think a lot of them are seeing that advantage be, being taken away from them or being distributed fairly, <laughs> heaven forbid. And so it's this like fear of, it's no longer my country, it's Mexicans coming in, it's you know minorities that live down the street from me, they're gonna get the job over me. It's all these kind of fears and hysterias and anxieties that are, are drumming things up for people. And I think that's what attracted them all to Trump. Yeah. He, he knows that, he's definitely um, inciting all that Absolutely. very purposefully. Yeah, and I think that this there's a, a false no a false narrative, a false belief that is the concept of scarcity. Now scarcity exists, but only because we've created it, right? Like we live on a self sustaining planet, but we've bastardized it, right? Um and right. that we've created scarcity, but this fear that's predicated on, oh, if somebody else has something, that means I have less. It's completely false, right? Just because somebody from across the border, undocumented or not, gets a job, 99.99% of the time doesn't mean you're losing yours, right? It's a, it's a false, it's, it's right. an alternative fact, if you will. False know. equivalency. Yeah, false equivalency. Um, but I think the movie touches on that too, you know, um, and, and how that's predicated. Oh, I was going to say. How it's predicating on the white man's brain, you know, this false. Right. I was going to say, I just, this is a more of a superficial note, like about the design of the film, but I love the, um, all of the references to Charlie Chaplin. You have him, Charlie Chaplin being played in the film and the big posters of him on the steps up to the whatever whatever kind of theater that was. It felt like more like a museum, but it was like a, a showing for the upper class one percenters to come and watch. And when he um, steals the bellboy cost um, yeah. a uniform and walks in there, it's just this amazing moment. Earlier in the film, he was Charlie Chaplin, right? When he was in the clown outfit on the street twirling the sign. They even modeled that costume, um, the director said, after Charlie Chaplin to kind of like drill that point home. Now that is skilled filmmaking and that is such attention to detail. Um, there's several other Charlie Chaplin like references and points of contact like throughout. And um, just, just the fact that he wove those kind of themes in, it's just, it's so interesting. Um, Charlie Chaplin himself had this like, um, heavy makeup on and wore a mask and did not act at all realistic or like himself, right? Which is how um, Arthur had to do when he was the clown. And there's just so many like parallels. And I mean, how can you not think this film is incredible and deep and rich and layered? I'm, it's beyond me how anyone just thinks it's bad. It's beyond me too. And, and I'm, I'm, really trying to be careful, you know, in, in reading about specifically the racial undertones about this movie and how, you know, most of the people of color in this movie, with the exception of um, Brian Tyree, I keep forgetting his last name, that's the clerk at Arkham that he gives the file to, the other right. people of color in this movie are women. And what is it taught? Right, is there's three women of color, yeah. But what are we saying that are, you know, because they don't have major roles, okay, fine, but they do have important roles. You know, the social worker is very much within the scope of her resources trying to sympathize with her, or with, with uh, Arthur. You have Zazie, or Zazie, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, who we know isn't 
in a relationship with him, but she was kind to him on the elevator and she related to him when she put the imaginary gun to her head. She's like, this building sucks, right? So like, she was not rude to him. She was not mean to him. Then you have the woman on the bus when he's laughing his, or when he's playing with her son and she's like, leave my son alone. Um, he was not kind to him. Yeah. You know, he was acting like a crazy person once he started laughing and that's based on a real syndrome called pseudo bulbar um i don't know if it's pseudo bulbar disease or pseudo bulbar affliction but it uncontrollable hysterical laughter can affect people who are in the early right. stage of Gehrig's disease who've had head trauma so that was based on reality but then you have at the end when we kind of cut quick cut which i want to talk to you about when he's in arkham at the very end in this, the final scene of the movie and he's being um talked to by a psychologist or psychiatrist also a woman of color and of course we're led to believe he's killed her based on the bloody footsteps that uh, uh, follow i don't know about that i don't know about that but i, I want to talk about that but i just want to say like i'm trying to look at this movie like as not a white person right can but at, right. at the end of the day I think the same issues that people are taking with the fact that there are women of color in this movie that are aren't treated well is I don't know right. a, but it, it, it narratively is actually really smart because the women although they're minor characters are important characters and they have agents yes and they're not like and, tokens and 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 they're very much, um, they're not taking shit from him. I don't know. Right, and you could argue that he doesn't mistreat them. I mean, uh, anything, he really hasn't, didn't do a lot of violent or rude things to those women in the film. So what do you think? That are blatantly shown, at least. I want to ask what you think happened. I mean, psychiatrist at the end. I, I want to know why the choice was made to to cast those four, the three black women and the black um, clerk with the file as African American around him in similar roles of uh, like a person that might be able to help him. I, I just want to know, I just don't fully understand the casting choice there to make them African American um, because there wasn't, he didn't have a lot of aggression to them because of their race right i didn't sense any hostility or racism from him toward them correct so that makes me wonder why that choice was made i have an opinion but i want to say one thing mm -hmm. before I, I i share my opinion on this um because we're in 2019 and even though i only have 100 subscribers god only knows i say one thing wrong and whatever but i i want to say this about that like uh, uh I think that even though Todd Phillips hasn't been on camera or on print talking about the race, racial elements of the film in great detail, I'm going to tell you what I think and, and why I think these are smart choices. And I know that I'm a white person. I can't help it. God forgive me. But I do think... White explain to us, Melissa. <laughs> I'm going to white explain. So I think that the fact that that initial subway scene in the first act of the movie where we see Arthur uh, perpetrate violence for the first time. Because in, 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 the, in the opening scene, we see him get attacked by a group of kids and there are some kids of color there, but he doesn't fight back. He's getting, he's getting attacked, right? Then you see a reference to an actual thing that gets murders on the subway from the late 70s where a white man murdered three or four black young men because he assumed they were coming for him when they weren't and then after the fact went on this race racist tirade and they intentionally referenced that but they flipped the script by making it about class and arthur ends up defending himself against these two or three wall street white guys and ultimately murders them i think that's smart because it's speaking not that racism is not an issue because it is, but it's speaking to the classism that cannot be separated from racism. And by making, if he had murdered black people in this movie on camera, this movie, everyone would be up in fucking arms. You know it. Like we're already, people are already up in oh, arms. Oh, sure. But like 
this movie would be like, we have to ban this movie and blah, 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 blah. Whether, whether true or false, right or wrong. They were still like that and it didn't happen. <laughs> then you have these, you have Zazie Beetz character who, the, 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 oh, sure. from him being in the apartment without her letting him in, he's broken in somehow. When we realize that the relationship is a delusion and you see her terrified and then it just cuts to him leaving and walking down the hall and it, it asks the audience, like, did he kill her? Did he not kill her? We don't know. And then the same thing happens in the final scene with the psychiatrist where we're led to believe he killed somebody because there's bloody footsteps after he leaves the session, but it's not explicit. So I want to know what you think happened there, but I want to say one more thing mm. about the class issue. It like, to me as somebody, and this is where I want to be very careful, to me as somebody that grew up not wanting for anything, but grew up lower 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 middle class but i think and dave chappelle has talked about this um i think that people on the same class level in spite of their race have more in common than people of a different race if that does that make sense what i'm trying to i say? agree yeah if poor white and poor black, of the different class you mean right yeah like if you're a person of color you're you have it worse like no one's arguing that no matter what class you're at like you have it right worse. Those right are true facts. right but if you're poor white you have more in common with somebody that is disenfranchised because of their color than somebody who is of means because you understand what it's like to be ignored by society not have access to resources um, be looked at like white trash or, or yeah. whatever. I personally, in my experience and what I see in 37 years of living on yeah. earth, class kind of trumps racism in terms of shared experience, if that makes sense. And I think- Right, in that area, I yes. That. I think this movie is articulating that by not being explicitly about race. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, but- I don't think he is a racist figure in the film at all. Because whenever you see him killing, he's mostly killing white people. And even if it could be implied that he killed a black person, I think he was more of an equal opportunity killer um, to, to any race. He certainly, I don't think when, when he was talking to the social worker who was an African-American woman, I don't think he would be, have been talking to I don't think her race factored into the conversation based on his interaction with her. Agreed. I think his mental illness and he was jaded, but I don't think he was jaded because of her. I think he was jaded because of life. That moment in the film where he says, I've never had a happy moment, a single happy moment in my entire life. You believe him like that. His performance is so great, but like, so he's very jaded, but I don't think he's racist in the film. Agreed. Maybe it's a missed opportunity that the film could have made a more profound statement about race, which could have been interesting or powerful or inspiring to people, um, or, you know, good for people to see, um, or just interesting. But like, I don't think it did. Maybe it's a missed opportunity a little bit. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, perhaps, but I, I, I have to say the fact like, I feel, with my 2019 glasses on, I feel like if it had been more explicitly about race, then that would have meant that more acts of violence would have needed to be perpetrated on screen against people of color, which then would have meant more people as audi in the audience would have been outraged. Outrage. And not... Yeah. And see the movie for what it was inviting us to even about. even if it was even if the message was anti-racist right. the racism portrayed to get to that message would have outraged people yeah exactly there's it's a no uh, missing the greater point it's yeah. a no situation and and i do um you know we can we can wrap this up it's um we've got it like it's four it's 722 there's only really one more thing i want to yep. talk about 
um, do, 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 sure. Right? Wrap, wrap it up. Right. Do your thing. All right. So I, I want to say this about that. So there's a, we know the Joker as a character from pop culture, from comics, from film, and, and, you know, from Prince's, um, you know, infamous Vicky Vale video. Um, but we, we know the Joker as an agent of chaos, right? And, and I think with Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker, that is explicit. Like, he doesn't have an agenda. He's not motivated by anything. We don't know what his backstory is because he keeps changing it when he tells it. He just wants, as Michael Caine says in that, that franchise, he just wants to see the world burn. So if we look at Joker, Joaquin and Todd Phillips' version of, of Joker's origin story <clears throat> being something that um, is the precursor to him becoming an agent of chaos, I think it's really interesting. <laughs> The movie doesn't give you, like we've just been talking about the race and the class and all of the mental illness, it doesn't give you hard and fast answers on anything. It just asks more questions and asks you to ask more questions. So I think that is a perfect precursor to him becoming an agent of chaos because as one person mentioned um, in one of the things I was reading, the movie is like in his journal, his joke journal and all that shit is like a manifesto but there's no target. He's not racist overtly that mm. we see in the film. We know he's mentally ill. Um, we know there's issues of class weighing down on him. Um, daddy issues. But there's no, there's daddy issues, but aside from Thomas Wayne, who we know and have been told up until this movie, he kills, he doesn't have a target. And the movie, does such a good job of that because with the twist at the end where you see that well, the talk the talk show host well okay so he is like an ultimate target for him yeah yes but i wouldn't but i but i see what you mean i don't know that that was a target so much as like an in the moment disappointment because he had built him no up. because it, it was like it was like a long history where like he built him up in his mind, I think you were going to say. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, he, whatever, would, whichever things were real or not, we're not sure. But in his mind, that was like a father figure to him who he had gone to bed with every night, who he had fantasized was like a, a father figure. And then when he showed the comedy clips of him at the club and like railed on him, it was like the ultimate portrayal of like exposing him and his um, exposing his all all of his flaws like to the whole world, and um, it was like the ultimate betrayal. And uh, after that, he just was like, "I'm gonna, I want to kill him." Um, but it's interesting because when he's rehearsing for it, he kills himself right on the couch, or he mimics like he's gonna shoot himself but then in the moment decides he's gonna shoot him. Yeah, so saying that um, hmm. Robert De Niro's character wasn't a target might have been a, like a miss, like not the right way to articulate it. Clearly he was a target, but what I meant to say is that like, that wasn't an agenda that he had. He wasn't like, I'm out to kill this guy. Like right. it happened as a buildup of like events, but ended right singular moment where he realized this guy doesn't give a shit about me. It wasn't a political agenda. It wasn't like a, a thing. And then you have, you know, the subway murders and then him killing um, Murray Franklin or whatever Robert De Niro's character's name is. Then you have all of his cronies in the clown mask projecting their ideas of what his actions mean onto this figure, Arthur, Joker, whether they be true or not. Because we know as audience members watching this trajectory of this character, he's yeah. overtly racist. Um, he's not out to take down the man. He's out to just survive the day, ultimately. Um, and society is breaking him down. And then all of this shit is projected onto him as he's seemingly defending himself and his psyche against what is an onslaught against it. And I, I think that... Um, 
there, it's referenced in the movie, um, and, but I just read about it, but there's a Batman graphic novel called Killing Joke by Alan Moore that came out in 88. And there's a quote in it where Joker says, you know, sometimes I remember my past one way and sometimes I remember it another. So if I have control over writing my past, I'd like it to be multiple choice, which I think is a brilliant commentary on a mental illness and being Joker as an agent of chaos. He doesn't have an agenda. And I think we talked about right. this offline. I think this movie triumphs if it triumphs in no other way, it triumphs for this reason in that it asks the audience to consider how much of your outrage, how much of your 2019 glasses are you and your ideologies are you projecting onto this character? Because ultimately, he has no agenda. He wants to see the world burn. And you even see that in the final act, right? Like all of these people with the clown masks, it's like anonymous from V for Vendetta, but without an agenda. Like you see all of these people projecting yeah. their fears and their neuroses and their, their own being ground down by society onto this figure who ultimately was just trying to get through the day. And that I think is the, right part of the movie you know like are we as as assigning meaning to something that has no meaning and what are the consequences of that that's brilliant and that's a brilliant way to end it the like end. i i yes <laughs> the end <laughs> you literally ended it because <laughs> it was such a good point but thank bravo you. thank you but no that's that's what i take away from it it's like I think it's brilliant, I really do. I don't think it's empty or vapid, but even if you do, it, if you're not asking yourself how much of your own shit you're projecting onto Joaquin Phoenix portraying a comic book character at the end of an hour and 50 minute movie, then the movie has failed, but it doesn't because you right. all, therefore like what's wrong with us, you know? Yeah. I think some people are just mad because um, the comic world is sacred to them and the character of Joker and Heath Ledger's portrayal of it is sacred to them. So how dare anyone else try to go there? Yeah. Um, but in, in a way, I've been waiting forever for this film. Yeah, I, I same. I, I, think Great. It's, mm, I think it's superb. And I think yeah. the fact that you can have a two hour conversation about it is all that you need to know. Right you seeing the film and yeah and we could have had a much longer conversation too yeah. go all day us too yeah and I, <laughs> I wanna yeah i wanna thank you guys as audience members if you've watched this for watching it and we would love to hear your opinions um please don't forget to um hit the notification because we have this was a, a brief reprieve an important one because we had to address Joker, but we are coming back with AVP and AVP Requiem for our Alien uh, Predator Universe saga, and then big things coming down the pike after that. But um, yeah, click the notification bell so you know when they go up, and then please comment, please like, please subscribe, and then as always, please check out www.chadcivic.com. It will be linked below. Um, but yeah, we hope you enjoyed this, and we will see you on the other side. Be on the flip side. Okay.